Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. I know that it's early, but I, I know that there's coffee out there. Um, my name is Annetta Ford and I work, I have the honor of working with Community Building Initiative. Welcome to everybody to this morning's Women's Stories of Hope and Courage. What we're offering today, um, you will hear our ongoing programming of fault lines. Today's stories, you will hear about personal, some personal fault lines and how women have overcome them with hope and courage. Today's program was definitely a labor of love as we wanted to honor women in our community who inspire, motivate, and empower us. To learn more about the work that CBI does um, other than programs like this, please visit our website at cbicharlotte.org. Um, the other thing that I would invite you to do is to mute yourselves so that everybody can have a good experience. I will also invite you to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat function at the bottom. It's just so good to see everybody um, and hear these inspiring stories. Um, we are really, you are really in for a good, good treat. So I invite you to grab a tissue. I invite you to grab some coffee and I invite you to just snuggle into a very comfortable spot as we begin. I would like to introduce to you uh, Jeep Bryant, who is a trusted CBI friend, but also a CBI board member. Jeep. Annetta, thank you. Thanks for your work in uh, making this program ha happen today. And I also want to join Annetta in welcoming all of you and uh, saying good morning. This theme of uh, fault lines really emerged at CBI. As we were thinking about the actual earthquake that happened in North Carolina in 2020, I think it's, it's easy to forget among all the extraordinary events of 2020 that uh, the ground beneath our feet in North Carolina literally did shake. So we've been asking uh, at CBI, what is it uh, in the ground? What's beneath the surface in our community? Uh, in other words, what do we need to examine? And what do we need to really address before another event really shakes us to our core? So we've been examining the fault lines of inequity and injustice, fault lines of racism and of bias. And we know that discussing and addressing uh, the fault lines in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County really does take a balance of hope and courage, the hope to stay in the conversation day after day after day, and courage to really force the, the hard work of systemic change. So for today's stories of uh, hope and courage, we could not have hoped for a better storyteller. Hannah Hassan is an award-winning, highly acclaimed spoken word poet Hannah believes that it is our words, it is our stories uh, that can set us free. Her work explores themes that, that center home, social justice, racial justice, and women's rights. And at CBI's annual stakeholder breakfast uh, in December, Hannah's poetry called out in such a powerful way the fault lines of, uh, of where we live, of fault lines here in Charlotte, of the ground that we stand on. And in particular, she called out by name the neighborhoods, the communities that we have lost. So all of us at CBI are delighted to welcome her back this morning uh, for some additional stories that, uh, that we need to hear. I hope you'll join me in an appropriate uh, Zoom welcome for Hannah Hassan. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Jeep. Good morning. Um, we are going to ask that um, for those who are just joining us, if you don't mind muting yourself, um, 
And I, I want to share a little bit about what this is from the storytelling, from the artist's perspective. Um, so we've chosen to use the art of storytelling to honor five women today. Three of those women are making an impact in our community right here, right now, every day. Carrie Cook, Carola Cardenas, and Sue Kumar. Today, two women that we will honor are no longer with us in the physical realm, but their legacies are strong and will live on through the work that they have done. Jill Dinwiddie and Teresa Elder. So for this process, I interviewed Carrie, Carola, and Sue. I talked to them about the moments in their lives where they had to choose courage. And all of them have impressive job titles, but my goal was to learn more. It was to get beneath the title and to understand what drives the women. And they delivered. They shared open heart, vulnerable moments with me. And for the two women who are no longer here with us, I interviewed other women who have shared community with them who have learned from them and who are better because they know them. And they shared beautiful stories with me. After all of the interviews and conversations, I then wrote the stories in monologue form. I compiled their truths together and I recruited a team of women storytellers who are all artists who serve our community to share these stories today. You see, something beautiful and really magical happens when one woman speaks another woman's truth. We find ourselves in each other's stories. We find connection and meaning in the experiences that our sisters have had. And we hold each other and heal each other in the most delicate and meaningful ways when this kind of transfer of energy happens. I didn't want to put the labor on the women who we're honoring to have to speak today. They do that often. They do it in our communities. They um, are public speakers. They speak on panels and they, they deal with staff and, and all of those other things. I wanted them to just experience their stories through the eyes of another woman. And I also recruit, recruited a, a few powerful people um, from my CBI Leaders Under 40, Class 6, um, Kim, Bridget, and Quentin, to help me with introducing our honorees and closing the show out today. Sharing the stories of our community, it truly does take a village. So today, we honor our sisters through the art of storytelling. We see ourselves in their experiences. We invite you to sit back and let yourself feel and witness their truths. And before we get started, um, I wanted to point out the um, program that is in the chat. Megan has posted it. Um, please reference it so that you can see the run of show and that you'll know um, the beautiful and amazing people who are presenting in front of you. I want to thank CBI for um, pulling me in to, to do this project. I want to thank all of the women who have trusted me with their stories and their experiences. I want to thank the storytellers who are artists who give to our community every day in such meaningful ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you for willing to learn stories and share them and honor the women that we'll be honoring today. And then my members of class six, who have joined me on this journey. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And also we will again ask that you just make sure that you mute, your, mute yourself. Um, and we want to suggest that you put your um, Zoom in speaker view. Um, that will help with the experience as you watch and experience the show. Megan has placed in the chat some information on how you can do that. All right, as we begin, we will start with honoring Jill Dinwiddie. Jill Dinwiddie fought for women's rights and to help us see the dignity in others, regardless of class, color, culture, or faith. 
Her curiosity about the world beyond her own came from her mother, who was always engaged in the community. Jill's heart and mind were further broadened by her family hosting a Swedish exchange student, then sp spending four months of her junior year in high school as an American field service exchange student in Turkey. She lived with a Muslim family and learned to appreciate another culture and experience that shaped what was to come. Some of Jill's job titles included director of the International Center at UNC Chapel Hill and the University of Texas, vice president of public policy for the Association of International Educators, director of Senator Diane Feinstein's uh, Northern California office, and executive director of the North Carolina Council for Women. She cared deeply about access to reproductive health care, accurate sex education, curbing domestic violence, and electing women to public office. Today, as we celebrate Jill, we will hear more about her accomplishments and all of the beautiful ways that she showed up in the world through a story that was shared with me from her dear friend, Jenny Ward, honoring the strength and courage of Jill Dinwiddie and sharing the story of Jenny and Jill, we make space for Francis Bender. I am Jenny Ward and Jill Dinwiddie was one of the strongest and most beautiful women I've ever known. It was about 12 years ago when Beverly Perdue was running for governor of North Carolina. First woman governor. I met Jill then. We were introduced by another fabulous woman in my life in this community, uh, Shannon McFadden. Jill was responsible for the campaign in Charlotte to get women behind Beverly Perdue's run for governor. So I met her in that capacity and I knew from the start, this, this, this is a woman who gets stuff done. My first meeting with her, she was direct, she was focused. She said something to me that day that, that it just stuck with me. She said, I, don't have a lot of time left in this world and the stuff I want to get done, I'm gonna get it done. I was so impressed. She was so focused and it, it drew me in. And that's a quality that Jill had around anything that was a, a priority she thought that the community and the people just needed to know about. She really worked to get women elected. She knew when women held public office, things would be better for the community. We have different perspectives as mothers, as sisters, as aunts, just by being a woman, thinking differently. And, and she stood in that. I mean, the list is long. Alma Adams, Vi Lyles, Julie Eisholt, Kay Hagan, the list goes on and on of women she personally supported and just drew people to and, and said, you know, this woman needs to be in office. She ran the campaigns. She got people to care and she helped put these women on the map. After that, we became friends. I lost my mother when I was 21. I'm 50 now. So meeting a woman like Jill at a stage in my life where I had young children and I was working full time, it was really special. She was like a mother. She was a mentor. She was a friend. <laughs> she was a grandmother to our children. She and her husband, essentially, they became adoptive parents. It was, it was unique. We had this really special relationship where our passions just aligned around the same issues. Like, you know, she, she helped me identify what was important to me. And I would just, I would run with it with her. We had this complimentary relationship that just worked. After Beverly Bertu became governor, she appointed Jill who was then retired, by the way, she was like 60 at that point, and she appointed her to run the North Carolina Council for Women as the director. <laughs> of course, Jill said yes. She was commuting back and forth from Raleigh to Charlotte. She had an older husband. She had a staff and a budget. She ran right into that 
and she did a great job. You know, it's funny because this time around she was consulting with me. <laughs> she hadn't, you know, done any of this in a while. So I helped her, you know, with the figuring out of the, her team and the structure. And, you know, after that they had, you know, been there for a while, they had a board, an appointee board. I was asked to join the board and was appointed by the governor. I later uh, chaired the board. So here we are. We're working on domestic violence. We, we came across this ancient document from the North Carolina Council for Women. It was a, a statute. Within the statute, it basically outlined the purpose of this council. You shall run a public awareness campaign funded to bring this issue to the community. It had never been done because no one could ever pay for it. The public dollars, they weren't there. It was 12 years ago. And domestic violence was a very taboo subject. No one wanted to touch it from the private sector with any kind of a funding perspective. But Jill and I, <laughs> decided not to let that stop us. We used our connections in Charlotte and created a statewide campaign called the Enough Campaign. And well, we got Jennifer Appleby from Ray Ward to partner with us. We put together a committee of judges and people we thought could bring something into this. And then this, this is Jill's gift. Here's a community issue nobody wants to talk about. Oh, let's tackle it. Let's get it done. We raised over $300,000 from corporations and individuals. We thought, uh, we're, we're going to run this campaign. We're going to do it. Like, like the teen smoking campaign. We're going to get companies to buy into this because guess what? They have employees and family members that are impacted by domestic violence. I mean, they aren't talking about it because no one wants to talk about it, but it's happening and we're gonna get them involved. Jill and I, banging on doors. People were like, what, uh, domestic violence? Uh, why would we want to get involved in that? But we didn't stop, you know, you know. We did that for several years and it was successful. It got copied and mimicked in all of the markets in North Carolina. And, and then Ron Kemble lost his daughter. She was killed due to partner violence. So he and Jan developed the Jamie Kimball Foundation in her honor. Jill and I decided not to turn the Enough campaign into a nonprofit. So we sat down with the Foundation for the Carolinas and merged the groups. The Enough campaign became a program of the Jamie Kimball Foundation. Jill and I served on the board and got it off the ground. She also got me involved in Planned Parenthood. Jill and I talking again about a non-popular subject in the community. I mean, it was very polarizing. So we thought, you know, all right, we're going to take this uh, a different angle uh, to the approach of the topic of reproductive health. We decided to get people together to talk about it. We planned a community event, event called the, the Reproductive Health Forum. We recruited Jennifer Roberts, who was mayor at the time, Judy Schildner with Temple Bethel and Dr. Ophelia Garman Brown and faith leaders, community leaders and health leaders all in the same space to have an important and well difficult conversation. We started to register this with the community. Okay, so you may not agree with abortion and that's your choice, but you have got to understand that access is important. You, you've got to understand the bigger picture of reproductive health and that it starts with education. It starts with access. It starts with affordable health care for women. We didn't stop there. Jill, as well as myself, served on the board for Planned Parenthood regionally. Jill helped with the onboarding of the new CEO, Jenny Black. Jill helped with the Planned Parenthood merger here and embarked on a capital campaign for a new health center in Charlotte. Jill led that with Crandall Bowles and, and Linda Hudson. It, it was, well, I was part of that committee as well. And then that, that work with Planned Parenthood and that health care center 
is one of her major legacies. Jill had a way of bringing people around issues that they did not want to talk about. She had a, a way about her that it created space for people. She made you feel like you could join in. If you, you could just be a part of something bigger than yourself. And it felt innovative. It felt entrepreneurial because it was. From leading on opportunity to Planned Parenthood to elections and campaigns and to her commitment to the arts, she had her hand and her heart in work for this community that mattered. It was just, it was magical. She was just magical. And in her final days, she was still talking about domestic violence and women's reproductive health and how proud she was that we were able to move the needle. Jill was a very strong woman. She was not someone who had it easy. She, she shared stories with me about the moments when things were tough. She was a single mother. She raised two daughters. She was just a really strong woman. She knew that you have to create your happiness for yourself. You have to find out what your niche is and you have to build and work towards your goals. You have to be bold about it. Jill was bold. <laughs> I mean, she wasn't brash. She was bold and, and thoughtful. She exuded that. That was her power. When Jill called us, the answer was always yes. Yes. When Jill calls, you say yes, because you know she was calling for something that mattered. She was on a mission to make other women stronger and the community stronger. And, and she knew that she was doing that and she kept running with it. She was just bringing people to her army. Jill Dinwiddie gave me the permission to lead with courage, to lead boldly, to, to lead with honor. Don't apologize. Don't let rejection get you down. Don't let anyone strip you of your power. Don't let your internal voice take you down. Jill Dinwoody was a coach and a mentor and a, and a cheerleader. She would mentor young women, women too. And women, they need cheerleaders like that. We need people to validate us. We need people to hold us up and show us a way and just let us thrive. It's always other women, women like Jill. Jill Dinwiddie, strong women. May we know them, may we be them, may we raise them. Today, we honor the women who care for our community. We give love and light to the experiences that have brought them home to themselves, that have reminded them of their own internal light, that have shifted something, changed something on the inside. And as we share their stories, the truth of their experiences, we find the connection in our own stories. We see their beauty, we see our own. We see their journeys. We see our own. Sharing the story of Carola Cardenas, a woman who learned the power of fighting for what she believed in, we welcome storyteller Kerma Moraine. I remember exactly the moment where I paused and I thought, this is my fight or fly moment. I was in a court hearing. I was fighting to be able to stay legally in this country. I was deported in 1989, I believe was the year. 10 years later, I was able to come back into the States in the year 2000. 
I did not have legal documentation. I came in with a tourist visa. I applied for a request for the government to be able to stay. Thanks to President Clinton for signing an act that was a temporary law to be able to apply for residency, I did so. When I walked into the courtroom hearing, I was hopeful. I said to myself, you can do this. You've worked so hard for this moment. You know you deserve to be in this country. I went to the court hearing. I kept giving myself a pep talk. I walked in there. I was only there for about five minutes and the judge said, you've been deported. I don't know what you are doing in front of me. You shouldn't be here. You should be deported. I felt like the roof had fallen over my head. I felt like I was buried in a ton of bricks. It did take me a good minute to find myself again and take a deep breath and center myself. I really did have a fight or flight moment. I had a split second to say to myself, am I going to stand up and walk out? That was my initial instinct. I'm just leaving. They are going to deport me. Someone's going to come in here and take me in handcuffs. But I said, no, Carola, you've worked hard. You know your case, fight it out. You deserve to be here. I thought about it for about 30 seconds. I said, this is your moment. Are you going to give up and walk away? Or are you going to fight? I stayed and I fought for two and a half hours without an attorney because I couldn't afford one. In the US, in immigration court, you don't get an attorney assigned to you. It was just me and the judge and the security guard in the room. I wasn't allowed to enter with my now husband. So I had to enter alone. I pleaded my case. I spent that time answering questions, explaining my file line by line. He grilled me on everything I had submitted. He was aggressive. He did his job very well, but I couldn't let him rattle me. I had to maintain my composure. Two and a half hours, I fought, I fought for my life. He did not make a verdict that day. The verdict was mailed three months later. And the verdict was that I was allowed to stay legally in this country. And then I became a US citizen. When I was waiting for those three months to hear if I was going to get my residency or not, I made a promise to the Virgin Carmen. I promised her, if I get my residency, I will, do, I will do everything within my power to fight for those who need my help, for those whose voices are not heard, for those who might need legal help to get into the United States. I've kept my promise since that day. That moment changed the rest of my life. It made me stronger. It made me understand that you don't always have to fight yelling. You don't always have to ha have a physical fight. You can be cordial. You can respect someone even if they don't respect you. And you don't always have to run away. You can stay, stand there, stand up for yourself and what you believe in, 
you can communicate your thoughts and actions if you know what you've done in your heart is the right thing. That was the first time I truly had faith in me. It was just me and my boys. I had nothing else in that courtroom. It was just me and my boys with the choice to stay and fight or give in and run, I stayed. I fought for me, I won, and now I'm here. I stayed, I fight for others, and bit by bit, we all win. Today, we honor the women who care for our community. We give love and light to the experiences that have brought them home to themselves, that have reminded them of their own internal light, that have shifted something, changed something inside. And as we share their stories, the truths of their experiences, we find the connection in our own stories. We see their beauty, we see our own. We see their journeys, we see our own. Sharing the story of Sue Kumar, a woman who has had to work her way through systems to achieve her goals, we give space for storyteller, Sharde Hassan. I moved here to this country when I was almost 23 years old, after graduating from architecture school. It's possible that I have always been brave and bold. But to be honest, there was a time when I first learned the importance of speaking up, especially when there are systems that exist to create opportunities for those within the majority while excluding those in the minority groups. I was volunteering at my son's school I was coaching some science Olympiad events. Um, and I noticed that there were a lot of biases within the committee that ran that group. Although the committee was through the school, it was managed mostly by the parents. There was a man who was in a leadership role and he made most of the decisions. He was probably the kind of man who was used to his voice being the loudest, and the most important in the room. He was someone who had power. I noticed how he wanted to have his kids on the team, but they didn't have the merit. They did not qualify. And it bothered me because I knew that it was unfair for the children who didn't have a voice. They were mostly from diverse backgrounds, from minority backgrounds they were being overlooked and excluded, and I knew that I needed to speak up. I stood up and voiced my concerns to both that man and the other members of the committee, and I did not back down. Eventually, it did make a difference. Later on, I would become one of the committee members, and we took that small team, that public middle school team, to the national level. Our team placed fourth in the country for that particular event. That situation helped me not only to realize the power and the strength of my own voice, but it was also a reflection of the fact that there are systems that exist in small and big ways that can exclude others if we're not willing to do what it takes to require change. I knew how the system worked so I spoke up to change it. Another challenge came up when I had to face a different system on a professional level. This time, I didn't fight against the system. 
but I had to work with the system. Once you complete your architecture degree in India, you are certified to work as a professional architect. However, that's not this, the case in the United States. That is fine and it is totally understandable. You have to go through internships and pass exams to get your license here. And I was willing and ready to do that. However, there's another loophole that has to do with the credentialing system. When they saw my transcript and my education history, they recognized my architecture degree to be valid, but they did not recognize my high school diploma. So I found out that I would have to go back and give my high school level exams, not just English, but everything, mathematics, physics, chemistry. Either I had to pass those exams or go back to high school and give the 11th and 12th grade again, which made no sense whatsoever. I went to high school, graduated. My graduation was recognized so that I could go to college, but they created this hardship. They create this system of hardship that makes it impossible for some immigrants to go through with getting credentialed in this country. I know because a few of my friends migrated here with me and it was a major hardship for them. They just, they weren't able to do it. Everyone can't remember what they studied 20 years ago and pass calculus and other mathematics exams in order to sit for the architecture exam. Those are some systemic things in which I don't know why they exist. Maybe just to discourage people. If it were just the architecture stuff, yes, a thousand percent. They wanna make sure that what you have studied there matches what you are doing here. You're building in this country. You are designing in this country and you need to have the knowledge. And I completely respect that, but that was not the case. In my particular case, I didn't fight it. There just was no way to fight it. I had to work my way through the system and it took a lot longer than I would than it would have if those barriers weren't in place. What it does to an immigrant is makes it very, very hard. Until you're a registered architect, you can't find any good jobs. Your salary is less. It's an economic hardship. It's very discouraging, especially if you're a woman and if you have kids. I study while I have my little babies. <laughs> Fortunately, my husband was able to support us financially, but if I would have been on my own, there is no way that I could have completed it. Those are the roadblocks that exist in the architecture profession where I come from. But again, I, I couldn't fight against the system, so I worked within it. Some people fight, and that would have taken me many, many, many years. I probably never would have gotten my licensure and I needed to work. I needed my job. At that time, I didn't understand racial, racial biases, but I now understand that it's in place maybe to weed out those that they want to exclude. I didn't think of that at the time. I didn't look at it through the lens of equity. I just saw it as a hardship that I needed to overcome. There are very few women of color in my field. It's very small, very, very small. I am an architect. It's more than a job. Now I work with a group of architects who have had many years of experience as project managers, just like me. And I'm the only woman of color there. The only person of color who's an architect. And that is a pretty big deal. I bring a diverse perspective and cultural value. I stand out. And I'm careful. Because I know I'm working 10 times harder to make sure that I'm not letting other people down. Other people like me who are aspiring to be an architect or to be some other kind of professional. 
I carry that weight because I'm representing people from my background. And I wanna make sure that I represent them well. Asian women make up less than 5% of registered architects today. And this number was much lower when I got registered back in the day. So I work, I work hard and I speak up when and where I can to let my actions speak for others like me. A native of Charlotte, North Carolina, Carrie Cook is grateful for the opportunity to be a servant leader in her local community and beyond. She is the current executive director of the Greenlight Fund and the founder of the nonprofit organization Empowerment. Carrie believes deeply in empowering girls and women to develop their full potential. She understands that honoring our experiences and creating a space to be authentic in our learning, growth, failure, and success creates transformational leaders and community. She has won multiple awards and acknowledgements, including the Young Public Administrator of the Year Award from the National Forum of Black Public Administrators, Emerging Leader Woman of Achievement by the YWCA Central Carolinas, and the Harvey B. Gantt Community Service Award. The United Negro College Fund recognized Carrie with the Maya Angelou Young Leader Award in 2016, and in 2018, she was recognized as the Woman of the Year by the Mech Times among their 50 most influential women in the Charlotte metro region. Today, we honor the women who care for our community. We give love and light to the experiences that have brought them home to themselves, that have reminded them of their own internal light, that have shifted something, changed something inside. And we share the stories, the truth of their experiences. We find the connection in our own stories. We see their beauty. We see our own. We see their journeys. We see our own. Sharing the story of Carrie Cook, a woman who has learned early the importance of stepping up for herself and for her team, we welcome storyteller Erica Truesdale. When I think about leadership, and early on in life where I saw my leadership skills develop, I think about high school. You know, it was an outlet for me, not only to play basketball, a sport that I loved, but I was a freshman and I was the starting point guard on the team. You know, the point guard is like the floor general. The point guard has to see things and make things happen. Every other team member feeds off of the energy of who's running the point for the team. And as a freshman coming into high school, playing varsity was a big deal. Being the starting point guard was a big deal. So I realized this is a bigger stage. I was a freshman with sophomores, and juniors and seniors looking to me to be a guide. They were looking to me for leadership, for energy, for camaraderie, to be that boost. They were looking for me to lead. And I recognized, man, you know, even though I'm a freshman and a lot of these girls are older than me, and I look up to them, they're looking to me to set a tone. And that was a big deal to me. See, I didn't take it lightly. I knew that I would be a part of where we went as a team and how well we did. And to this day, <laughs> to this day, I still have my shirt from Vance High School, one of my basketball shirts. And on the back of it, it says from worst to first. We were last in the conference that year. I came in and was the freshman point guard on varsity. And then we won the conference championship. 
So we were first in the conference. You know, I look back and I'm reminded when asked to step up, you might not be the likely person. You may be the youngest, you may be the newest, and that's okay. When the opportunity comes, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to step up and be the floor general that you were created to be? Are you going to lead your team with courage and integrity? You know, I'm always going to roll with my team. You know, that's, that's who I am. And I'm still close with my Vance high school teammates to this day. They know if something comes up in the game, Carrie's going to have your back. Not only am I going to have your back, but I'm going to do what needs to be done so we can get the mission accomplished as this team. That's what a floor general does. You know, you step in and take whatever the assignment is for that day. And although I was the floor general on the basketball court, my home life was quite chaotic. <laughs> you know, my, um, my father was getting ready to go back to prison. And it was a time as a teenager where I was trying to figure life out. I was trying to figure my identity out, you know, it was crazy. So I acted out, I acted out trying to figure out life. Basketball was my outlet, but there were times when I wasn't in my outlet that I didn't know how to cope with certain things going on in our family dynamic. So, <laughs> Jametta. <laughs> Jametta Martin Tanner was an assistant principal at Vance High School and she was my AP but really more like my guardian angel you know I call her my angel principal <laughs> I was doing stuff I have no business doing at the time and there was one instance I remember vividly I was in class and the other kid was saying something and we were going back and forth and back and forth and I got up in his face I did and it was definitely an instance where I maybe should have gotten suspended. <laughs> you know, I should have gotten in trouble in some kind of way just because of the way the confrontation went down. And we were, you know, disrupting class. But instead of that, Jametta took me in her office. And Jametta, she said, listen, you've got to realize what you've got inside of you. And this is why you have these, these different things coming at you. You've got stuff going on, but you've got to learn how to cope better. You have to realize the potential that you have in you. Let's not blow that up. And so she pulled me in and she let me work with her and sit with her. She put my energy to use in a great way. That wasn't, you know, and that wasn't the only time. At different times, she had a message and a word for me. She stood up and stood in for me. She wasn't going to let me be another child lost to the school to prison pipeline. She wasn't going to let me be discarded or tossed away. She wasn't, she wasn't going to let that happen to me. And I think Jametta saw her students in herself. She saw parts of herself, parts of her family. You know, there were a lot of us, especially young Black women that she inspired and got together. She wasn't willing to accept mediocrity, but she was willing to fight like hell for us. You know, Jametta was like, nah, I'm standing in the gap. I'm standing up for you. Um, I was coaching basketball at Vance High School when I had my full circle moment. I was coaching there because this is a place that poured so much into me, that, that gave me so much in my formative years. And it was then that I realized that these girls, they really need outlets at this point in their lives. And this meant so much to me you know, that I was working a full-time job and showing up to coach after work. You know, when I was there, I started to notice something. I would see other girls that weren't even a part of the basketball team wanted my attention. They'd be like, hey, Coach Cook, you know, hey, what's up, Coach Cook? <laughs> you know, I could see that they wanted to have that connection, that relationship with another woman leader in the community. And I noticed that a lot of the programs that used to exist when I was there was no longer there. So this was definitely a full circle moment for me. I couldn't deny the power of what was going on. And I immediately, I went into planning mode, you know, I, you know, floor general stuff, right? And it was clear that there are girls on the team and just other girls who are looking for that connection with adult women leaders. So how can we pull them in? How can we be what they need at this point in their life like Jametta was for me at that point in my life? And that was the summer. That's the summer when I decided to do the Youth Empowerment Summit. And it would be the perfect opportunity to bring girls and women in our community together. And I didn't know what the outcome would be. <laughs> I didn't know what exactly uh, it would lead to, but I knew that it was needed. 
I knew it was time. So we had the very first empowerment summit that year. And nine years later, empowerment is a fully functioning nonprofit organization that connects girls and women in this community in such an impactful and important way. You know, we stand in the gap. We stand with and for these girls and help them realize their full potential in the way that Jametta did for me. You know, I show up in this way because of Jametta and all of the other women who were teachers and mentors as I grew and learned who I wanted to become. And, and I am because of these women, women who were the floor captains in my life. And as I move through life, I keep, I keep the goal in mind. And the goal is to think about all of the other women who poured into me and to not just take that and leave, but to figure out how to let that cup run over and to pour into others. You know, I don't want my cup to have filled up and be like, you know, I'm good. No, my cup should be filling others over and over and over again. That's what a good floor captain does. You know, that's, that's how I show up. That's how I lead. Today, we honor the life, the work, and the legacy of the late public health pioneer, Teresa Delreen Elder, also known as TD. Queen Mother Elder was born in September of 1927 and passed earlier this year on January 5th, 2021. She was the very first African-American public health nurse in Charlotte, North Carolina. She attended and graduated from West Charlotte High School during its inaugural year in 1938. After graduating high school, Elder attended Johnson C. Smith University for a year, but later transferred to North Carolina Central University to study nursing. She went to work at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Charlotte in 1948. In 1962, she started working as a public health nurse for Mecklenburg County where she would go into communities and perform health checks or administer prescribed medication. Her success was measured by the decreased numbers of absences in schools and a greater health literacy among the families she was responsible for. Mecklenburg County tasked her with the responsibility of breaking the color barrier in public health service. Along with another African-American nurse, she was assigned to predominantly white districts. She experienced skepticism and received disrespectful language. Elder even treated patients in Ku Klux Klan territory within Charlotte. Over time, she gained the same kind of relationship from her new patients that she received from her previous patients. Elder worked with Mecklenburg County Health Department until her retirement in 1989. In 2001, Governor Mike Easley conferred upon her the Order of the Longleaf Pine, and in recent years, the Teresa Clark Elder Neighborhood Park was created in her honor by the Charlotte Parks and Recreation Department. Those who were blessed enough to know and share space with Mrs. Elder understand her impact. They understand because of the way that she impacted them. They witnessed firsthand her generosity, her wealth of knowledge, her love for the community and her commitment to her people. Today, we seek to honor that impact with a story and a poem shared by Hannah Hassan. I have been impacted, held up and loved on by many women in this community. One of those women is Annetta Watkins Ford. You see, I was on a call one day with Annetta when I noticed that her usually sunny disposition, it felt a little darker. I could hear it in her voice. 
When I asked her what was wrong, she paused, took a deep breath, and told me that one of the giants in our community had passed. I like to call her Queen Mother Teresa Elder. It hit me like a ton of bricks in that moment because I, I love Miss Elder. I was blessed to share time and space with her at the ribbon cutting of the park that was named after her. And I, I got to write a poem in her honor and I performed it in front of her. And afterward, she took me to the side and spoke life over me. She gave me words of wisdom and made me feel like I was the only one in the room. I love Miss Elder. So when Annetta gave me the news that day, it was difficult. And I wasn't surprised that Annetta was having a difficult time as well because Mother Elder, she touched all of us in different ways. And as we were discussing the magnitude of this loss, Annetta reflected on her story of her experiences with Miss Elder. She told me the following story. Annetta said, Hannah, I get chills and I get emotional just thinking about her because I know that she's now no longer here. When I first met Miss Elder, it was 20 years ago. It was when I first started working at CBI and we were working within one of the programs. It was called the University City Community Building Project. And it dealt with working with University City Y and the people from the area who were community leaders. The goal was to build community in the university area. And Ms. Elder was one of those community leaders that I was introduced to early on when going to these meetings. We just hit it off. She reminded me of my mom. She was just wise. And when I heard her story of being in the medical field and all that that meant to her, and I learned what she meant to the city, it was just such a powerful experience for me to know her. She never met a stranger. She was so generous in her wisdom and guidance. And anytime I would see her, I would attach myself to her because I wanted that wisdom. And over the years, we continued to have encounters. I remember when we started doing the bus tours in the city, we were doing them for Atrium. I had the idea, so what if we asked Miss Elder to come on the tours and, you know, tell her story? And when she started Carolina's healthcare system, the, the old Good Samaritan Hospital, she was there at the beginning. So this was an opportunity for people who didn't know her to, like, get to know her. She is their history. She is our history. And she came and she talked about being the first black nurse and working with the doctors in the ER and why it was important to, to not just retire and stop serving. Her energy was boundless. And every time I would see her, I would say, I hope when I get as young as you, I can have that kind of energy. She was everywhere. She was a staple in the community and our community will not be the same without her. Annetta shared that story with me. And then I shared the story of my experiences with Mother Elder. And we held space with each other that day for the gift that was Teresa Elder, for the beauty of the truth of her life's work and purpose, and for all of the girls and women and just people that she impacted in moments large and small with her voice, with her works and her life to be able to share with Miss Elder when she was here and that I hope can share her story a bit now that she is no longer with us in the physical realm. When you have come to raise the village, the village that you have known, the village that is your home, when you have come to raise her health care, to raise awareness that you care, to create spaces and places that nurture your own, when you have come to raise the village, you take the education that you got there and you bring it back home. You break barriers and burst through doors. You stand as the first, the first black woman who wasn't there before. You create a space beside you for those behind you who are coming up next. 
You let the works that you have done bear witness to what can be their future success. Because when you have come to raise the village, you stand as a good Samaritan, giving light to God's plan. When you have come to raise the village, you make the village your priority, regardless of skin color of its inhabitants. And when they call on you to desegregate, when they call on you to work your magic in clan land, you raise the village, you raise the village, and you care for the people in a way that no one else can. When you have come to raise the village, you nurture new mamas, you teach them the tools with the babies in their arms, you educate, you remind them of the skills that they will need to teach those babies as soon as they get home. When you have come to raise the village, you aren't just working at the hospital, you are helping to deliver babies. You are in the operating room, hands on, right beside the operating table. You are the advocate for the people's health, the door-to-door -door face of the health department, you are providing services, raising awareness, healing Charlotte. When you have come to raise the village and you are at the heartbeat of the people's well-being, you raise the village, you heal the village, and you give nursing meaning when you have come to raise the village you have answered a divine decree. Our creator in all of his glory, in all of his light, in all of his majesty placed you here, put you on this mission, said there is work to be done, put you in this position and said, raise the village, raise the village. And in this service, Teresa Elder, you will find your wealth, raise the village, heal the village and be a beacon of hope and light for the public's health. Teresia D. Elder, Sue Kumar, Carola Cardenas, Carrie Cook, and Jill Dinwiddie, women who raised the village. Women who lead with courage, women who invested in Charlotte. We honor their contributions. We stand in gratitude for their stories. We remember that we are all greater, that we are all a bit bolder, that we are all closer to living in the kind of world that works for all of us because of them and so many other women just like them. As we reflect on the stories that we've heard today, stories of sisterhood, stories of mentorship, stories of courage, of standing up and speaking up, of bold acts of resistance, of empowering acts of personal freedom, I ask you to think of the women in your lives who exemplify these very same qualities. Take a moment and think of the women, those who are still with us and those who are no longer with us, that you have encountered in this community showing up in these ways. If you're able, I would like for you to either write down their name or silently speak their name to yourself. I also invite you to offer the names of those women to this group. I would like to ask you to put their name in the chat. And as I see them appear, I will speak them out loud.
Vanessa Baxter. We speak her name. Janae Walker, we speak her name. Mary Alice Walker, we speak her name. Karen Kane, we speak her name. Rosa Watkins, Ruby Mills, Hannah Hassan, Diane English, TD Elder, we speak her name. Barbara Miller, we speak her name. Edna Hill, we speak her name. Sonia Gradic, we speak her name. Octavia Sewell, we speak her name. Aura May Tresdell, we speak her name. Dot Partlow, we speak her name. May Orr, Alice Norfolk, Krista Terrell, we speak their names. Krista, Christy Lee, Megan Jones, Dot Counts, Scorgans, Kathy Hasty, we speak their names. Susan Harden, Luz Castillo, we speak her name. Rosa L. Cora, Ali Bynum, Annetta Watkins Ford, we speak your name. Rose Amid, Astrid Chirinos, Juanita Green, we speak their name. Susan Harper, we speak her name. Karina Caporino, we speak her name. Thank you so much for speaking their name. Thank you so much for the beautiful, empowering, courageous, inspiring stories that we've heard from our many storytellers. I'd like to turn it back to CBI. Oh, Quentin, it's your friend, Diane. And I cannot tell, hey, darling. Um, the beauty of this work is in its purpose and in the relationships that are forged and formed. And we've been blessed this morning to be the beneficiaries of being in this village that has been created through the magic of, of Hannah's heart and mind and the stories of the women that we have been privileged to uh, listen to. Um, and I guess what I would just ask us to do is to, to think about this village and the voices and the stories and the courage and the hope they give us uh, today and all days and the courage that they exhibited in their lives each day, not easily, not universally, not one point to another always, but the through line of their lives that is also the through line of our lives. So I thank you for being here. I thank Hannah and Annetta for working together to help create this. I thank all of you who shared your stories and the, and the opportunity we have to think and stand with you and in awe of you, but as we stand together and how we amplify each other's voices, knowing that it takes nothing from each of us. It just amplifies all of us. And especially for women and the men who support and love and that we love in return. So I'm grateful to CBI for giving us this platform. And for those of you who've been a part of this today, um, I hope you will be on the lookout for a short survey so that we can glean from you the, the wisdom of what you've heard and what you'd like to see. We have conversation cards. If you'd like to keep the conversation going, let us know and we'll send some to you. And stay connected to us because we wanna stay connected to you. Um, if there's anything else that any of our team would like to say, Annetta, if there's a, a parting word that you'd like to offer, or Hannah, if there's a parting word you'd like to offer, um, we have 
just these few minutes to do that. But the chat room I know is, is very busy and that's wonderful. Um, so I'm reluctant to say goodbye and it's not goodbye. It's just a pause for now. So if we go back to looking, I may get out of, out of this one box and go back to gallery for just a few moments so that we can see each other's faces and call each other's names and cherish this time we've had together. Anna's words and the inspiration of people's stories and turn them into something that was meaningful and connecting to Corolla, to Sue, to Carrie, to our precious Jill, to our precious TD, and all of you who amplify and uh, exhibit the gifts they share with us and shared with us. Hannah. <laughs> uh, and then thank you so much, Diane. Um, happy Women's History Month to everyone. We all know that we honor, um, we should be honoring the, the women, um, not just in our community, but everywhere who are working hard every day to make our communities the types of communities that we are able to live and love and laugh and all of those things in. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. This was early, <laughs> um, but it was worth it, I believe. And I just want to uh, reiterate um, that it takes a lot for someone to share their story with a stranger. Um, I don't think any of these women, um, except for Carrie, maybe knew me, um, but they were all willing to um, open up and share parts of their life with me. Um, and, and I don't take that lightly. Um, I stand in deep, 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 immense gratitude for that opportunity. So every woman who spoke with me and shared the truth of your life and your experiences with me, I honor you. And I hope that you felt at least a little honor in hearing your story reflected from the amazing storytellers that were here today. The only thing that I would say is um, what a way to end Women's History Month. Uh, this is proof positive that it's not just a month, it's always. So this was amazing. Thank you, Hannah.